We shall now uh, take a break while everyone <laughs> listens to Holy Diver. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Pause the podcast. Go listen to Holy Diver by Dio and then come back. Shoot the core, cast. Welcome to Shoot the Corecast, the official companion podcast to the RF Generation Shmup Club. This is the family-friendly Shmup-themed podcast where we like to kill Bido, and we like to use force to do it. From RFGeneration.com, I am Metal Fro, also known as Game Boy Guru, and my co-pilot on this mission is... Addicted, also known as Addicted to Shmups. You know, that was a pretty good start for our dad joke of the month. We could have also said the... Uh, Force bit was strong with this one. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> nice. Uh, as we kick things off, just want to let you know if you'd like to connect with us, uh, make sure you follow us on Twitter at ShootCoreCast. You can follow me directly at Game Boy Guru. Uh, you can find all the feeds where our podcast is available uh, at linktr.ee slash shootthecorecast. Uh, do make sure you join rfgeneration.com and join us for a Shmup Club playthrough there on the forum. Or you can join us on our Discord server, uh, the uh, RF Generation Discord server, and post there. Or tweet at us with your high score screenshots or photos and let us know what you think about the game. Also, please uh, subscribe, like, rate, or review on your pod preferred podcast platform. You can also follow me on... Uh, Twitch to see notifications of new streams as I do stream the Shmup Club Game of the Month uh, every month, multiple times, and that is twitch.tv slash guru Game Boy. We'd also like to mention the R of Generation community and everyone who plays through the game with us for the month as a shout out to the Playcast and the Collector Cast as well. One of these days we'll join them in Dark Souls. Yeah. <laughs> we also have a great database there, so you know it, it's really good for making sure that you don't buy that 25th copy of Madden and you realize that you know maybe 24 is enough. I would think 24 copies of Madden is enough. Yes, I'm sure somebody out there ha has has at least 50 copies of Madden for some reason and. Uh, well, I just hope that they're all in open and they can exchange it for something they really want. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, they might have to exchange all 25 copies of Madden in order to get something they really want. Like our type three. Oh, there you go. Nice segue. Uh, but before we get into discussion of our game of the month, let's briefly talk about the question of the month that I threw out on Twitter. Which is, if you could invent a new weapon for an R-Type game, what would it be, or how would it work? And right out of the gun, our friend Duke Togo over at the Collector Cast said, Let's put the toothpaste laser into R-Type. Wow, I, I think that's the first time they have said something without it involving Dark Souls. And that... That kind of cross-pollination of shmups could be dangerous. So uh, I dig the idea, but wow. I don't know. That's uh, That seems pretty radical. I know. I, yeah, you know, uh, I don't know. I'm going to need some time to think about that. I need some coffee. <laughs> no, I, I, I honestly think that a... If you look at Bandai X or Bandai Cross Namco... In some of the other cross-pollination or cross-events, I think we should do it. I think it would be great to get some of stuff in there. Let's just see random stuff thrown in there. I mean, shmups allow you to experiment and to have fun. You know, if your main character can be a finger that goes pew-pew, you can pretty much do anything. So let's have fun with it. Our next one comes from at the single banana. 
The correct answer, of course, is... And he provided a picture of Kiss Love Gun Single. So, in other words, Single Banana wants a love gun as a weapon in our type. That That's, sounds more uh, like um, or something for... Um, Galgun, or uh, what, what's that other one that, that we covered earlier with the the Proteus one with the uh, women, the women who have uh, abnormally large hit boxes? The granny uh, spin up the Proteus, the one that comes with its own touch sensor. Oh, uh, Odomedius. Yes, uh, that sounds more along the lines with Odomedius if you're talking about love gun, get that or gal gun, and that, that's maybe a little too. Uh, itchy or uh, risky for this podcast. Yeah. <laughs> Still, an interesting answer. Uh, at Pony Tatsujin says a shield force that acts the same way as the shield from Reflex. Now that's an interesting idea uh, because actually that's a cool um, a cool concept of being able to use the, the force pod to reflect enemy fire instead of simply absorbing it. I kind of dig that idea. Our next one comes to us from at Fran Freaky. Free range from Thunder Force 5 would be awesome. And I love free range. And, but, but isn't it where the one where it always mispronounces it? It's like free range or something like that. What's up? Uh... That could be, yeah. But that's an, an interesting idea too. I'm not sure how that would work given the generally slow pace of the R-Type games, it seems like either that would be OP, or you'd really have to do something with the mechanics to sort of make it fit with the R-Type flow. You know, I say that you know, if we're going to have something like that, make it DLC, and just something to break the game. You spent $9 on this, it's now the game's broken. Just enjoy. Obliterate everything. <laughs> Or that that uh, that could be you know, like R Type Final Two, right? You got the DLC. That'll be the fifth DLC. Spend ten dollars and turn on easy mode. Let's just bl- obliterate everything in its path. There you go. Uh, at Gollum Liv says R Type's three weapons cover different spaces: red, middle, blue sides, yellow edges. But those plays those spaces all start at the player's ship. So my new weapon would start at the right edge of the screen and travel leftwards towards your ship. Interesting. I mean, as we get into talking about R-Type 3, there is one weapon that sort of does this, but not entirely. It's like the, the seeds of that idea, but it's not a full implementation like this. But that would be kind of interesting as a, as a concept. Yeah, I like that idea. All right, our last comment comes from us from Ad Hauser. Something that creates an energy beam between the ship and the force when you launch it and also makes the force move faster, so you have to move around the screen grabbing, throwing throwing the force to kill enemies. It's, so it's almost like a... Not really like a boomerang, from what I understand. It's sort of like a... I don't want to say that sort of you're going to start laughing, but I was um, sort of like a ball in the cup in some ways. Well, I was, oh, I see what you're saying. I was thinking uh, tetherball. Tetherball, yeah. Or you know, a ball in the um, cup, yeah. It's like, I want to say that there is a, a ship or five maybe in the original R-Type final and possibly in final two that kind of has this where your force pod stays tethered to your ship with a little bit of a an energy ribbon and it can damage enemies but I think Hauser is maybe taking it in another direction where you can actually more directly manipulate the, the force rather than just sending it out and then calling it back but you know moving the ship around in such a way that like a tetherball it would you know, whip the thing around and be able to to run into enemies. Kind of like the, I don't remember the name of it, but the one of the melee weapon options in the day we fought space that you know we talked about uh, a while back uh, with the developer. You know, it kind of has one of those options where you can sort of swing this 
this uh, melee weapon around on kind of a tether or a you know a a rope or not a rope, but you, you know some kind of connection point. You're going in a totally different direction. I thought you would immediately make a connection to Einhander and have an arm that swings around or something like that. That's where I oh. was going with that. Oh it, sure. You know, it, it, if it if it comes bearing gifts from the moon, take it and run with it. You know, I, it's something where an arm that could act as a melee weapon to hold stuff will be great. Or you know, that would you get. <laughs> I just picture this little actuated arm on the bottom of the R ninety that could uh, throw throw weapons and stuff. But heck, you know, maybe that's our next Dojin game. Yeah. I mean, I kind of like what Hauser's going for here, though. Um, it's a cool idea. For me, I, I was kind of thinking along similar lines initially, but honestly, I, I would like to maybe see more more missile options because you kind of get a really vanilla missile option. And... So it would be nice to, to maybe open that up a little bit because obviously in the Gradius series you've got uh, as the series goes on you've got ships that have different missile types you've got some that will do upward and downward missiles some that explode on impact and create an area of effect some that will crawl the ground and uh, you know pick up targets along their way and some or, that just grow legs and walk <laughs> or some that drop straight down and then create a you know, a very big explosion or, or something like that. It would be cool if they expanded upon that idea and did something more. You know, what if there was a missile pickup that you could grab that would shoot missiles behind you? Uh, or, or something that would do something other than a missile. Maybe it would be like, um, like a concussion bomb or something so that it would shoot out a, a deal in front of you instead of a twin missile that sort of homed it would just shoot out something in front of you that then when it would impact an enemy or a surface it would create a large area of effect kind of explosion type of thing you know just just change it up a little bit or or do more than just vanilla missiles and expand upon that idea a little bit yeah our type is one of those game sets oh defined by its mechanics the way it has it that you really have to be careful because if you go a little bit too far out and this you you sort of lost what what made our type unique in the in the first place it, it's not one something where that gives you a lot more mobility options like you have in gradius you know it it, it its gameplay loop is fairly limited to what it is. It's still very good, but it, it doesn't give you a lot of freedom that, that you would get with some of the other shmup series. Sure. And I guess I could see why there are some who don't find our type final all that, all that fun, despite the fact that it really expands upon the ideas of our type and the weapon sets and so forth with all these different ships, because maybe some people feel like, as you say, it gets too far away from what our type has been and doesn't stick to the core, uh, sort of strengths of the series. Yeah. It's always hard to pull off something like this. And, uh, I mean, sometimes you deal with, you have your R-Type Delta, and sometimes you end up with R-Type Final or R-Type Final 2. It's hit or miss, but it's always nice to see people willing to experiment, willing to try new stuff. I, I don't, don't want to discourage any of that. I, I love the, the responses that we've gotten here. I, I think that they're inventive, and they're looking to seek a, new ways to change things up. Is Sooner or later, if you stick to this... The same thing, no matter how good the formula is, you're going to just start losing or have a hardcore group of people and you're not going to get new blood in. And then the series will yeah. stagnate and they'll just stop making games. So I'm glad that they're continuing to experiment, even if not all of them are going to be hits. Sure. I mean, it's kind of it's kind of the Raiden 5 argument. You know, could they have made Raiden 5 more like Raiden 4 and had it be a well-received game? Yeah, Probably. But 
would it have been criticized for sticking to the formula too much, whereas the Raiden 5 that we got deviates from the formula enough to where hardcore fans of the series often kind of push that game to the side. Oh, I don't like that. But I think that at least Moss tried to do something different and expand upon the idea of the Raiden series without going crazy with it. And, you know, for me personally, I think they they did a good job of finding a, a middle ground with that. But, yeah, I, I can kind of see how how there would be some who would not want to see it expanded too much further. Yeah, and it's not just with STGs, right? It, look, look at anything that's been serialized. I and mean, we joke and took a jab at Madden earlier, and Madden's the same way. It's, you ask someone, a buddy who's not hardcore, like, what's the difference with Madden? Most people say, oh, it's a roster update. You ask somebody who's playing into it and say, oh, yeah, well, you got the right hit stick. They finally stopped this bug and that bug. And But then maybe some people thought it went too far. It's it's the same thing you get with any series that's gone on for a while, right? You want to stay away from making it too formulaic, but yet you want to increase and have variety so that you keep bringing people back. It's really a hard line to follow. Yeah, for sure. So, so what about you? I mean, me? if you... If you were going to add a weapon to the R-Type series, what would you do? If I was going to add something to the R-Type series, I would like to see it maybe fall, try something a little bit... Feel like a special ship that could capture weapons or capture enemies and use that against them. I would love to see maybe a little bit of Gyaris or... Uh, sorry, Gyaris and... Maybe a little bit of Cyveriar, some of those elements thrown in. I would like to see, be able to throw popcorn maybe at some of the bosses on there or uh, some other different ways to power up. I, I think that, I, I, if I remember correctly, our type t 2 does this, but I think it happens earlier, where if you collect this, a double of a power up, it gives you more. Or maybe I'm just, these things are starting to conflate all together in my head. <laughs> but. But doesn't our type? If you grab two of the same power ups, it actually makes weapons stronger. Yes. In final two. Yes. Okay, that I thought was a nice addition, a nice feature, and I would like to see a little, maybe a little bit more growing upon that. Just different ways to deal with the power ups. And you mentioned too with the missiles. I think that's wonderful, and the missiles are pretty much just short, short range things on there. In I'm certain we'll talk about it here, but with the different force bits, the way they have, we've got one that uh, <laughs> gives you green olive options, as I like to call them, and that is definitely different than anything that w was done before in this addition. We'll, we'll get into this a little bit more, but I, I would like to see more experimentation like that, where it, it's going to affect the playthrough or cause you to do something different, but I would still like to leave the standard way open. Th that's why I would say put in a different ship or a different, as we start with talking about our type three here, put in a different force bit. So that way it, it's a different playing experience for a different character. I, I would almost say in some of the ways, like a belt scroller does it where you have your middle character, your middle main character who's not too particularly strong or particularly fast, and you have your fast character, and then you have your really strong character, that, to me, would not be a bad way to start. You know, you got your ship that is hmm. offensive, you got your balance ship, and then you have your ship that is, is trying something new. And in this case, it would be the ship that could either throw enemies back, capture some of their weapons, or, or some sort of mechanic that is different. It... And again, I, I think this is what they tried in Final and Final 2 in, in some aspects of the different ships. I, I think it's a good idea and a good way to move forward or move the gameplay loop forward. Okay, cool. Well, thank you to all who answered the question of the month and gave us some interesting ideas. We appreciate it. Yes, thank you very much. I, <laughs> like, hmm, okay, yes. Is that your time? Maybe I droned on a little bit too much on that portion. <laughs> nah. You're just okay. If editing will fix that. You now spoke for 20 seconds. <laughs> All right. We'd like to give a shout out to our participants for the month of November 2021. 
We have Metal Fro, Addicted, Brando Reality, Fo Macho, Easy Racer, Corkman, and Gollum. Indeed. So as we have mentioned and alluded to more than once, uh, for the month of November 2021, we played R-Type 3, uh, also known as R-Type 3 The Third Lightning. Uh, this was developed by Tamtex, who apparently was originally a subsidiary of IREM at, you know, at one point in their, in their existence. Uh, some of the other notable games that Tamtex developed specifically are Hammer and Harry Ghost Building Company for the Game Boy, uh, they did Spartan X2 for the Famicom, the rare NES mech platformer Metal Storm. Uh, the uh, apparently they did the infamously janky NES game Deadly Towers. You know what the Famicom name for that is? Uh uh-uh. uh Hell's Bells. Oh really? Yeah. Well, that's uh, that's uh, that's appropriate. Uh, they did a pair of Super Load Runner games for the Famicom Disk System. And as far as I was able to tell, uh, their only other shmup is Tayo no Yuusha Firebird, which is based on the Brave Saga series. You forgot one game they developed. What's that? Holy Diver. Oh, that's right. They did do Holy Diver. I saw that somewhere else. We shall now uh, take a break while everyone <laughs> listens to Holy Diver. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Pause the podcast. Go listen to Holy Diver by Dio and then come back. Now, uh, R-Type 3 was uh, released in Japan December 1993 and then uh, followed a few months later in North America and PAL ter- er, territories. There was a port to the Game Boy Advance that was developed by the Italian outfit known as Raylight Studios. And that was released in 2004, but apparently only in North America and Europe. Uh, That never made it to Japan. Uh, It was also on the Wii Virtual Console for a a short time, but was apparently delisted in 2012 and 2013, depending on the region. It was included in the RetroBit Super Retrocade Plug and Play Console, And then there was a newer physical version of the game that came out in 2018, also through Retrobit. They did a, it's a combo cartridge that has Super R-Type and R-Type 3 on it. And it got released under the name R-Type Returns. And they did this really nice deluxe box set, which I have, that uh, has the standard size Super NES box with the cartridge in the manual and all that, but then also additional stuff like a poster and a cool R-Type pin and some other fun little tchotchkes in the box there. Yeah, the the interesting thing about about this version of this game is uh, it's the first time that R-Type was developed specifically for a console in mind. The previous entries were developed all for... Are either arcade ports or you know, were, were arcade games themselves. The R Type 3 for the Super Nintendo and the Super Famicom is. I, I don't think that this is a matter of opinion when I say this. I think it's a matter of fact, it is arguably. Uh, well, it is be- much better than the Game Boy Advance port, and we'll get into reasons uh, why here. Yes. Yes. But it, to give a little bit, a little bit of context to this, this was released in Japan in December 1993, but in 1994 it was released in the U.S. This is the same year that Super Metroid came out, the Saturn was launched, the PlayStation was launched, the 3D <laughs> was going, the uh, Donkey Kong Country came out this year. So many good games and technology. Well, I, I, opinions will differ on the 3DO, but a, a lot of <laughs> <laughs> games and technology came out this year, and so much came out that I w- would say this game, it was easy to see why this game became lost. And it's time. Shmups in 1993 94 were dealing with Gumbert. I mean, we're at that point where we're in Batsugan came out in 93 in the arcade. So it's 
we're already hitting the next generation uh, uh, late gen and the Super Nintendo came out in 90 in Japan for the Super Famicom and 91 in North America so by this time the Super Nintendo was pretty long in the tooth and age in the CD-ROM era was in pretty was in full swing so it's pretty easy to see why this would get lost and why they would sort of build this as the sequel for our type 2 and ex- expect only the hardcore to pick this up and play this yeah and that also explains probably why the game is so rare i mean shmups in general have gone up in price uh, quite a bit over the years and and generally speaking when you have a shmup that is at least marginally less common of a game it it goes up in price now on the super nintendo you've got stuff like gradius 3 which was a launch game or a darius twin both of which we've covered that was a launch window game and those are both very common because they were early games and lots of people bought them but when you start to get into later stuff like R-Type 3 or Space Megaforce, those kind of games, they're much more scarce. And one has to wonder if it's just because they literally printed far fewer of them because the genre had, I don't want to say stopped selling, but it had certainly stopped selling at the rate that it had been doing just three years prior. And not only that, by and large, anyone who wanted arcade stuff was going to the Mega Drive or the Genesis. That had that market pretty well uh, wrapped up. I just, yeah, along with that in the rarity, you could pretty much easily see how this would fall under the radar. I I don't want to use use that buzzword, but you, you know where I'm going with that. Yeah, yeah. it's easy to see how people might have passed this over in the store back in that time in 94 and how it just would have passed people by. Thankfully, they reprinted it, so no longer has to pass you by. Yeah, so I was very glad to see that. So let's get into the gameplay. Oh, gameplay. So... In R-Type 3, you pilot the R-90 Ragnarok, where the X button is rapid fire, the Y button is to single shots or hold down the charge wave cannon, and the charge wave cannon takes a cue from R-Type 2, and that allows you to charge it up twice. What's neat about R-Type 3 is it allows you to go into overdrive mode, which is extremely useful in taking out bosses. You can, basically what happens is you, it allows you to fire off a whole bunch of over, overpowered, I guess I'll call them lasers, there, and that do a ton of damage, but in return you can't charge up your shot for a limited amount of time. I, I right. really like that and thought it was a nice addition, especially for some of those bosses and ugh, stage two boss. Anyways, <laughs> that... A and B buttons detach or recall the force pod, and the R button changes between wave cannon types. And R type 3 was the first one to have different force pods or different force bits, or, you know, as I jokingly call them, space yo yo's. <laughs> so the first force bit is a round force, which is the same as the force from the previous games. With the same basic weapon set, you have your red helix laser, the blue reflection laser, and the yellow air-to-ground crawling laser. When detached, it fires forward, level 1, 2-way at 45 degrees on level 2, and 4-way at 90 and 30 degrees at level 3. The game puts this as for ace pilots only, but I I think a lot of people who have played some of the previous games might uh, be instantly drawn and find this a lot more familiar and easy to work with. Despite the new force bits maybe making the game easier. Did you end up using this a lot or was do you immediately draw on this? What was your playstyle like? No, I I mean I played with a little bit, but uh, honestly, because the the original force pod 
has been such a staple in the R-Type series, I definitely wanted to try out new stuff. Fair enough. All right, and speaking of new stuff, we have the blue... Oh, wait, hold on a second. No, we don't. <laughs> and speaking of new stuff, we have the Shadow Force, or the Shadow Bit. New to R-Type 3, this changes the weapon. This one has a red reverse laser, which fires lasers out at an angle of 40 to 5 degrees from the Force Bit and travel opposite the direction your Force is attached to the ship. If the Force Bit is attached to the front of the R-90, the lasers come out the ship's rear. At level 3, you also fire additional red lasers from the Force's position. There's a blue blue all-range laser, which is bluish-green lasers from the front of the Force. And at level 2, you get a shadow unit that can par be partially controlled and fires its own laser based on the direction it's facing. At level 3, you have two shadow units. Now, shadow units is... Uh, I don't like that name. I, I refer to them as green olive options. I... <laughs> those those seem to work out much better. So, I, I, I and it, it almost reminds me of a uh, like a um, maybe a popcorn enemy from Life Force. The way those things look, just have that eye. Just imagine oh, green sure. olive with the uh, with like a little bit of an eye or something in it for the, the red spot at the olive. All right, uh, when detached, it shoots for at level one. At level two, a shadow unit. Attaches doubling the forward fire at level 3. Shadow units attach to the top and bottom of the force and fire forward. When recalled, the shadow force jumps back to a spot near position very quickly for a rapid move of the force pod for offensive use. And this version of the force pod is the quickest to put out there and recall. I do know that the shadow units can, or the green olives can block some incoming bullets however i i didn't find it uh, that useful as a uh, offensive weapon the force bit was a lot easier to maneuver right did you uh play around with the shadow force and the green olives i did play around with the shadow force and the green olives uh a little bit toward the end of the month i think in particular i kind of messed with it a little bit at the beginning and then again toward the end just so I could uh, get a little bit more experience with it. Um, I feel like the Shadow Force is something that would be really, really good in the right hands or really good with a, for a player who has memorized the game quite well. I could see the red laser being very useful, particularly in certain situations, and certainly I found it to be pretty interesting in a couple of spots. The, the blue laser... I don't know. I it just didn't didn't do much for me. But I did think that the the yellow weapon was pretty cool on that because it sort of gave you, uh, especially at when it was powered up at level three, it would give you your two forward yellow lasers, and then it would have the yellow lasers that would sort of angle to your top and bottom. So I thought that was fairly versatile. The the best thing I like about the Shadow Force bit is the fact that the green olives track enemies and fire around there. I, I thought a spot where you may not always be able to maneuver your space yo-yo or force bit around, it's certainly helpful to have something else shooting. Uh, true. All right, and last but not, not least, we have the Cyclone Force, or force bit. This is also new to R-Type 3 and, of course, has its own weapon set. The red fires th lasers in the arrow, arrow shapes from the force pod. It can pierce enemies and some surfaces, though some walls still are impenetrable. And level three, the laser is very wide. The blue splash laser at level two, spread of three lasers from the force pod and their impact with a surface or enemy results in an explosion with area of effect. At level 3, it's a spread of 5 lasers that give you a near 180 degree firing radius. Yellow capsule laser at level 2 creates a capsule that will position itself in front of the force pod spot and fire a yellow laser with some homing capabilities, where laser fire will angle 90 degrees up or down to reach targets. At level 3, you get two capsules. Capsules change position every few seconds based upon your movement. 
and when detached, the Cyclone Force will not shoot. Instead, it will move around and damage enemies. At level 1, it remains normal size. At level 2, it begins to get a ring around and expand its range. At level 3, the ring gets larger, and its damage output increases. You can continually press the Force Pod button when detached to recall and cancel, so the Force Pod can rock back and forth in Zera to damage enemies. Uh, yeah, I believe this is one you the most. You talked yep. about, you know, what, what, um, rocking. Yeah, rocking. I'm trying to think of uh, almost sort of like walk, walk the dog in some ways. There, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and one thing I want to mention that I forgot to put in the notes is that the yellow capsule laser; those capsules will also block some bullets. So if you if you use the cyclone force and you have the yellow weapon, uh, those uh, you can be strategic about how you position those capsules so that maybe you can uh, start in one place and then move forward beyond their position once they're set, so they can kind of block some bullets that may be coming in from behind. So it's sort of an interesting way to kind of temporarily have uh, maybe the force pod on the front of the ship and those on the, the the rear of the ship or vice versa have the force pot on the back and you know be able to take out threats behind you uh but then have well have additional protection from the bullets so um but yes the cyclone force is the one that i use the most during the course of the month honestly the blue splash laser is a little bit OP and I'm totally okay with that because this is a difficult game. <laughs> so having that spread of lasers, having that area of effect or that splash effect uh, really does help with certain situations. And there are certain enemies that it helps to catch that might otherwise be harder to, to reach. And so I, I really do think it's a, it's a, a good, a, a good force option for, I'll say beginner or you know newer players to the series because it can kind of help you, kind of help you get your legs under you. Hey, in our type games, you're gonna need all the help you can get. Very true. All right. So speaking of help, we have the power ups. We have a speed power up which you can collect up to five, and uh, unfortunately, sometimes you just gotta collect them. <laughs> Can the the that stage two boss there? Those power ups stay just sort of stick around until you accidentally pick it up and then you die because you're going too fast. Right. You know, I, I refer to that as a rock on effect. Oh right, because you can you can uh, be going at Mach three speeds. Oh, well, with rock on, you can get at least up to Mach five. But you're just zipping around and your ship becomes a blur. All right, we have bits. And th this is not force bits. These are, I, I almost call them options in our type sense. And you can collect up to two of them. Yeah. And, and they are kind of options in the sense that they'll fire just standard shots from them, which helps. Yep. And we have the uh, aforementioned uh, one and only missile upgrade. And then we have the standard laser, cr laser crystals, which are red, blue, and yellow. The game itself has six stages, and most people make it up to probably about stage four before they uh, continue or give up in frustration. <laughs> and the stage two boss was changed from the Japanese version because the uh, projectiles are fired. Looked a little bit too much like giant sperm, so they were changed to giant eyeballs. But uh, honestly, it's not that much of a difference. <laughs> They, they, yeah, they, it's, it's pretty obvious. Yeah. Uh, although I, I will, will happily say that I am thankful that the really drab color palette from R-Type 2 has been changed. And it comes across with uh, in with R-Type 3 where everything is it, not um, cute em up type friendly pastel colors that you get from... Let's say something like Fantasy Zone, but it, it's certainly more appealing to the eye. It doesn't... Uh, I, I don't feel depressed after playing it. Huh. So the uh, Stage 4, as we just mentioned, with, where most players quit, has the Lava Maze. 
or Pink Lava Maze, which is infamous for its memorization and difficulty, and is featured as a DLC stage for R-Type Final 2. I remember uh, many a frustrated word being let out as uh, Studio Mutt Prince was playing this, and the uh, part where you have to go backwards through it, it's, that was the end for them. Yeah, it takes a lot of patience. It does. And speaking of stage four, it also has two bosses. It has a Reconjuninator, which is a, sort of a mid-boss halfway through, and Creature 666 at the end. And it is indeed evil. Indeed. Stage 5's boss fight is more of a boss rush, with the four previous R-Type bosses returning as forms of this true Stage 5 boss, Phantom Cell. This one was sort of weird. It felt like a... Um, Something you'd see out of Gradius, or, or more like Life Force, where it was changing. It's almost like a big blob of jello or a slime, and it just goes through and starts changing everything. It's a neat effect for the Super Nintendo. It really is cool. But on the uh, when it was poured over the Game Boy Advance version, it's not so impressive. <laughs> right. So it, yeah, it. I mean. Uh, I, I get it. If our type three were were in a game sack episode, it would definitely be in the games that pushed the hardware boundaries. It's technically impressive, and so many of the stages are built upon mode seven scaling or this and that, making the most of what the Super Nintendo has to offer. I mean, it's nineteen ninety four. They really should make the hardware seen and, and use it to its fullest extent. But at the same type, something like this could also be seen as a little bit gimmicky. I, I don't know. It, the, the boss, the boss of stage five, was impressive, but at the same time, uh, I felt like they could have done done something maybe a little bit different. What what are your thoughts on that? I actually kind of liked the boss rush because it was an interesting challenge. The thing that I noticed is that Dub Caratops, um, you know, the stage one, the iconic orange stage one boss from the original R type that uh, has that real specific HR uh, Giger xenomorph kind of look to it. Uh, not only did it have a kind of sported an updated look, but it's also, it takes a lot more damage to take down than the uh, original one you know the original one you could do two full charge shots to the little uh, the little baby head in its stomach and you could take it down whereas in this one I think it took something like six or eight fully charged uh, or doubly charged beams in order to take down so it definitely takes a lot more damage it's no more threatening than the original but it definitely uh, prolongs that fight a little bit more. But then it's cool how it kind of morphs into the next form and, you know, does something different. And so I, I kind of enjoyed the, number one, the homage to the earlier games. Number two, the fact that none of these were particularly difficult fights uh, until you maybe get to the last form before you fight the Phantom Cell itself. But it was it was a neat experience. And as I was kind of credit feeding through the game during the course of the month and I reached this point and then I was playing this I was like oh this is kind of you know different and new for the series and it sort of it was a different challenge than most of the rest of the what you think of as our type so I found it refreshing it, it, I guess for me it feels like a, something out of the Gradius playbook and I, I don't know, maybe if that's just me and it's going on there. It sounds like it, it is just me, but it, it felt something that, that I had seen before. Now, granted, I played this originally in 94, I, I, I would have been wild. And to be honest, I still think it's impressive what they did with the Super Nintendo's hardware. Here. Especially because I, during this entire playthrough of the game, I encountered maybe one spot where the game slowed down just a little bit. I mean, compare that to Super R-Type. Oh, jeez. <laughs> or even Gradius 3. You know, yeah, right. I mean, it's impressive that, the, the, based upon everything that's going on here, how little slowdown there is. 
Yeah, it's pretty well optimized for the hardware, I think. Uh, the final boss, Mother Bido, has two forms. The second form, yeah, I think it had maybe a little bit too much R, too much 1942 or too much random number generation. Yeah, when I've watched some some videos of the final boss fight on YouTube, it seems like maybe the movement of the arms in that second phase is semi-random. It, it feels like they kind of sort of track your ship's movement and kind of sort of move towards you, but then some of the arms still kind of go off in their own direction. So it feels like maybe it's all a... Like it's all a uh, a reflexive type of thing rather than the usual R type where patterns are more static and it's a matter of memorizing those very specifically. One of the things that you put in the outline here is the cutting room floor, which is a place that puts in all sorts of changes that were made or left out from beta versions of games or even when they were moved from one region to another mentions a couple changes from the Japanese to the North American release. One of those being a level select, which press the R button 10 times at, on the continue screen, then press L the number of times corresponding to the level you wish to play. And the Japanese version had end credits after completing the game, which, well, it's not in the North American version. I think that's probably because they didn't expect anybody to beat the North American version. <laughs> Uh, that's possible, but it's an odd, it's an odd uh, change to not translate the the end credits and just include those in the game. I, I don't quite understand why they wouldn't do that. Now, the uh, one of the other th interesting things I'll bring up is the Game Boy Advance port. It does something which I don't. I have no idea why they did this, but. But in the Super Nintendo and the Super Famicom version, if you die and you continue, right, you die at your checkpoint. And it goes, it seems, it reverts back to Super R type levels where if you die, you go back to the beginning of the stage. Yeah, there are checkpoints in the Game Boy Advance version, but there are fewer of them. I noticed that when I was messing with it earlier, is that when I died uh, in stage one, um, I, I managed to get far enough to actually trigger a checkpoint, but I think there's maybe only one checkpoint per level, or possibly two. Maybe you, maybe they give you a little bit of, of grace and and let you, uh, you know, start up right before the boss. But yeah, it seems like there are fewer checkpoints in that version. Uh, I really wanted to like the Game Boy Advance version, but it feels. <laughs> It feels more like, hey, it's our type. The gameplay is mostly here. It's That's the mo best I can say about it. Yeah. The, the, the Game Boy Advance version, I'll say this. Our type DX on the Game Boy Color is a much better game than our type 3 on the Game Boy Advance. The Game Boy Advance version is... Should have uh, included earplugs as part of the package. Oh, it's just hot garbage. I mean... It's a steaming pile of festering Why don't something. you tell us how you really feel? Oh, it's just terrible. And I, of course, I've got recency bias going on here because I just played it not that long ago. But it's just terrible. I know some guy, when we had him on to talk about his game Assault Shell, and we mentioned that we were playing R-Type 3, he said, don't play the Game Boy Advance version. <laughs> and I'm here to say that some guy was right. And it, that's 20 minutes of my life that I will never get back. Well, at least you played R-Type. It may have not it, sounded like R-Type, but you played it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, it didn't really sound like R-Type. But yeah, it's just bad. You know, the, the auto-fire rate for your weapon is painfully slow. It's very sluggish uh, for the main weapon. Unless you use the Cyclone Force and get the Blue Splash Laser, then it fires at almost twice the rate that it fires in the main game. Um, so it's it's janky. The hit detection is very dodgy in the Game Boy Advance port. And when you hit enemies with your weapon in the, in the Super Nintendo game, 
it sort of fla- they sort of flash to indicate that they're taking damage, but they only flash occasionally in the Game Boy Advance version. So you only get about a third of the flashes. So it doesn't necessarily always look like you're doing damage. Some sprites won't take any damage until they're fully on the screen and then some. So you're shooting at it and you can see that you're hitting that enemy or that turret or whatever it is. Um, but it's not doing anything to it until it's on the screen and past being on the screen. Then it'll finally blow up. And there are other uh, things that you're not touching them at all, but they'll run into you and they'll destroy you. Uh, such as the uh, the Fenrir, that big red mech that's sort of the set piece in stage one that comes in from behind you and then moves forward and you know shoots at you for a while until all of a sudden he crashes into the wall. Uh, I was I was playing and I positioned my ship just above him and then as he passed underneath of me, he did not our sprites did not overlap, but he destroyed me just by my proximity to him. So Is it's that just yeah, it's just terrible and I would not recommend it at all other than to say Maybe play it once to get an idea of just how well done R-Type 3 on the Super Nintendo is and how it could have been if the game had been handed off to another studio that didn't know what to do with the, with the property or did not take the level of care that was obviously taken with this game. Uh, One thing that I wanted to mention that uh, we touched on, but we didn't really cover in detail, is that the Wave Cannon has two forms now. So, as you mentioned earlier, it takes a page from R-Type 2 and allows you to charge your Wave Cannon up to a second level so that you get your standard beam and then you get your your, uh, wide beam shot where, you know, the standard beam is just like the original R-Type charge where you charge it all the way up and then you you shoot that uh, kind of uh, large energy blast out. But then when you charge it a second time and the meter turns orange, then it makes this really wide uh, beam that you shoot. And one of the nice things about that is anything that's kind of in proximity around your ship when you fire that takes damage. Um, so there are some there are some spots in the games where you might be you might have enemies kind of all around you and it's a nice way to use this sort of clear the field. But if you hit the R button to change it to hyper, then when you charge the hyperwave cannon, it sort of creates a, a short burst, like a five way burst uh, spread that it shoots out. But then as you mentioned earlier, then your regular bullets turn into these large energy blasts that you can shoot out rapid fire and they do a lot of damage, and so as the meter kind of drains, then you can use these bullets for a short amount of time. But then, as you said before, then there's a cooldown period where you can't use any kind of charge weapon, so then you're then you're uh, back to only using your regular weapon and your force pod. Yeah, and it's an overdrive mode, which I thought was pretty... It, it goes above and beyond what was in our type 2. Yeah. And the funny thing is, I didn't even know that was in the game at first. So when I started playing for the month, I was just playing with the regular the regular wave cannon. And then when somebody mentioned it while I was streaming, then I, I tried it and realized how good it was. So then I started to kind of pepper it in uh, as I was playing for certain strategic spots that it really works well. Did you end up using the, the hyper very much no like you i had no idea it was in the game till i took a quick break and read about it or watched a youtube video i can't remember which it was and like oh what? whoops i haven't seen that because more often than not i'll miss a game mechanic and i have to look back on it i am very much this this, this button goes bomb this button goes pew pew and this this button is your special or your focus and if it falls outside those things, I'm going to have to look it up or find it out through alternative methods. I'm 
not intuitive when it comes to that. Yeah. <sighs> All right. So let's uh, let's talk about the graphics a little bit. You kind of mentioned this earlier, but our type two in the arcade had a sort of grimy a, and yeah. dirty look to it. It's a brighter Geiger. <laughs> right. But, and, and that was kind of the direction that IREM was going at that point. You know, they did several games that were very pretty art style wise like that, but they also kind of had that brown, grimy, dirty look to them. I mean, they did R-Type 2. They did, what is it, uh, Gallop? And, you know, a couple of other similar games. And then that sort of developed into the the style that later influenced in the hunt and then of course the Nazca games like Metal Slug and and uh Gun Force. stuff like that. Yeah, Gun Force. But yeah, R Type 3 definitely brings back a lot of color to the series because the original to R Type is very colorful and very bright, uh even though it's got the sort of body horror type of uh, Gigaresque and that only starts Style. in like yeah, that's only the phase of this at level one boss, and then it starts going with stage two. I granted it goes further than that, but stage one for the most part is very sque- like 1950s sci-fi, squeaky clean for the most part. Right. Yeah, but then level two really ramps that up with a lot of kind of bio horror type of things. You're, it looks like maybe you're inside. Uh, some kind of an alien creature, or maybe you're just in a biological, I don't know, pit or corridor of some kind, but yeah, you it's know, definitely interesting. If we, if we were ever to get a crossover for, or, or a sort of a parody series on the R types series, I want what the final boss to be that dancing alien from the end of space balls. <laughs> I think that will work in perfectly. <laughs> wow. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I think I think the graphics overall are are pretty good. They definitely um, they definitely have some cool designs. Uh, I, I, generally speaking, I think things are easy to see, bullets, hazards, etc. Uh, although there ha- there were a couple of times when things were a little bit obscured by a background or the action in general, but, um, I, like I said, for the most part, I think everything stands out pretty well. And, uh, the, the graphic design was, was pretty good overall. Yeah. There's, there's no areas where you're going to be confused and lost in the, like your typical Damaku where there's a bullet that, does, that gets too close and you can't tell where that is. This has no battle Griga issues. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, I, I I think that the the, pal- the color palette works really well. You still get a little bit brighter, but you still get the effect. The one of the things I found interesting is the second loop, which I only got to because I was able to use uh, cheats or game genie. But the second loop changes some of the color palette. Did you have you played through that or knows that? Oh, uh huh. Yeah, the second loop on in the second stage. The uh, acid that's normally sort of like this brownish, you know, light brownish that drips down is changed to red. Oh, interesting. So, uh, in well, of course, it's more powerful and eats through stuff faster, but I wonder if that was maybe something that was changed from the original F- Super Famicom, something I didn't have a chance to go to. But the, the color palette changed ever so slightly. Huh. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't notice that. Um, but then I didn't reach the second loop. Well, you so. didn't cheat like me. <laughs> All right. Uh, I do. I did. Like I said earlier, I do like the look of the updated bosses from R Type One and Two. Uh, you know, Dab Caratops looked cool. Laos, which is a sort of, uh, I don't know, floating fortress thing that. You know, that was uh, pretty nice. It was a pretty good minor update of the R-Type 2 boss. And then the the Gomander, which was the Stage 2 R-Type 1 boss, had a little bit of a different, a little bit of a different color palette on it, but looked pretty good. 
Let's talk about some of the... Um, I forget the robot's name, but the robot at the beginning of stage one, the fact that it turns its head and is in there is just amazing little graphical touch and something that oh. most people will miss. But it, it, right. it gives it such personality where it just realizes, oh, shoot, I'm about to hit the wall. And then you see it splatter all over the place. I mean, that is a neat little trick on there. And you mentioned before the, the blob, the stage... Uh, the stage five boss looks pretty cool, and the right. stage six boss when it's trying to uh, stay keep the uh, space time warp area in effect. That is a cool effect too. The stage one background or mode seven effects that go through there. There's a lot of little neat tricks that show that they really had an idea of what the Super Nintendo could do. Heck, we already mentioned slowdown. There's no slowdown on this. Right. This is what you normally see at the end of a cycle and they they knew what they were doing yeah and they combined the mode 7 and some of the other graphical effects with a lot of interesting set pieces like that mech in stage 1 you know turning around and running into the wall and exploding or like the uh, you know the giant stage 2 boss you know where it just has a whole screen full of these giant eyeballs coming at you or you know the stage 5 boss rush with the the phantom uh, yeah, what did i call it the the, the jello thing the thing that looks like it's from life force yeah yeah the the, the battle with the jello mold right the uh, the phantom cell you know, with it it uh, morphing and changing into different shapes and things, I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of cool stuff that they pulled off in this game, and so uh, graphically, I think overall it's it's fairly impressive. Yep, and I got another one for you too, the force bit uh, selection screen. Oh yeah, talk about a good yeah. way to get you hyped up. Yeah, it's a it's a cool uh, a cool look where it sort of has that. You're you're in the cockpit of the of the R90 and choosing your force pod, and then it sort of looks like you're warping into space. Yeah, you know, the, I have to say, on so many of these, I mean, I realize they released the same year, but a, a lot of the aesthetics of this, in the way that looked, especially when you're looking at the customization for the controller, I thought to myself, that looks like it was taken out of Super Metroid. Mm, sure. And then some of the sound effects, like the boom, boom, you don't appreciate how well the sound is for this game and how well crafted it is. And rem- again, it reminds me of Super Metroid, but you don't realize how well it is until you get to the Game Boy Advance and then you feel like you're at an arcade playing, hearing somebody play Defender or Pac Man. It's, uh, we'll get into that in just a moment, but. Yeah, yeah. It, it really makes a nice effect on you and shows you that they were masters of their craft when doing this. It, I miss Irem. Yeah, I do too. You know, it, it's just like th- this is they were done such good stuff and such masters at two D art and in the hunt and so many great games. Yeah, you wonder, you wonder if the group that made In the Hunt that then left and formed Nazca, you wonder if they hadn't left IRM, if things would be any different, or if they still would have declined in their later years the way that they did. Yeah, it really makes you want me to... Isn't also uh, 94 the year that Toplan dissolved? Uh, that You might be right about that. I was just thinking about everything that's moving on here. Talk about a moment in time. 94 was one heck of a year for video games. Yeah. In regards to the graphics themselves, I also want to say how each shot looked distinct and was easily traceable, which is not easy to do. Even for We mentioned enemy shots, but even the player shot, you could tell where things were going. You could follow the path. It was pretty easy to determine what was being done in air read the field i should say it was a lot easier to read the field at any given time at no point on this today i ever say what the heck was that where did i get hit from 
Well, okay, maybe with the Game Boy Advance version I did, but not with the Super <laughs> Nintendo. Any other thoughts on the graphics? No, I think we've summed it up. All right, now we got the graphics. Let's go on to the sound. The soundtrack makes great use of the Super Nintendo sound hardware, with the uh, small exceptions in some ways. Uh, <laughs> the uh, re- reverb with a guitar maybe is a little bit too much, but I really did like the uh, stage one opening where the reimagining of track. That really is a good way to get you pumped up. Yeah, that was a, a nice touch with that sort of homage to the original R-Type with the little opening bit and then the stage one theme essentially being a a remake of the original R-Type stage one theme. So that that is a nice way to sort of tie it together. And as I mentioned earlier, a lot of the sound effects were, especially some of the explosions when those mechs explode, you get a nice boom and it gives you it's something that if you were playing you had like a 5-1 system you could imagine yourself being hit in in the gut from that sound it's got a good impact to it it really feels like something's exploding it's the type of stuff that you get in Super Metroid when something a new path was being created or you had just defeated Ridley or Kraid or something it's such an iconic sound effect, from it, and it's very well used here. Uh, some of the other stuff, though, such as the reflecting laser bouncing or the through laser shot noise, um, not so good. I, I, to me, it sounded like a the, like a high pitched whine for a while. I was like, oh, I was like, oh, turn that off, turn off. Let me stop firing my gun for a moment here. The, yeah, that can- and the, the through laser. That was just weird because it makes this sort of like ding, 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 ding every time it shoots. And that kind of drove me bonkers. So I don't really understand what they were thinking with that because it's not a very convincing sound for a laser. And I don't know, it's just tinny and weird and annoying. Yeah, and and some of the uh, explosions for something like the popcorn enemies... They're not terrible, but they're a little weak for the popcorn. Oh. Right. And they're, it's just sort of like it could have used a little bit of stuff on it, which is fine. No video game's going to be perfect. And if the worst I can say about it is, oh, they could have tweaked just a little bit here and there, you know it's very good. That's true. I mean, it, we're, we're at a point where we're kind of nitpicking it, but realistically, yeah, there were a couple of sound effects that were a little weak, and certainly a couple that were annoying. Yeah, and, and, and sp- when I say annoying, a level of, you know, w- one being okay, and then at the other end of the spectrum, 1942, I, I would say that we're, we're probably on a two, maybe a three at most. This is this yeah. is nowhere drums and whistles. Yeah, <laughs> right. So... Uh, as far as the uh, sound goes on the Game Boy Advance version, oh boy. Uh, if anyone has ever been in a 1980s arcade, that's probably about the best you of the sound chip. I know that the uh, Game Boy Advance software, or the Game Boy Advance isn't known for its sound chip on there. It's, well, it, it tries, I, I guess. I could say it it tries to recreate it and uh, put on mute and play uh, Holy Diver. You have a much better experience. Yeah. As I was listening to the music in stage one, uh, f- at, f- at first I, I thought, well, this sounds kind of weak. And then second, I thought, okay, they didn't even attempt to replicate all the instruments. And then... The next thing I thought was, wait a minute, the core melody is wrong. They did something to where they didn't even replicate the melody very well. And there's a a couple of bad notes. So it it just, it was just a very poor attempt to try and replicate the game. But the sound effects are weak, uh, even weaker. I mean, you know, we talk about a couple of weak sound effects in the Super Nintendo version, but on the Game Boy Advance, all the sound effects are weak, and it's just very, a very poor showing. 
I would love to put that at the we'll put that at the back of the box. A very poor showing, Game Boy Guru. <laughs> Well, now uh, that you've given us your impression of the Game Boy Advance game, what do you think about the Super Nintendo version? Well, this is one that I was I was kind of looking forward to, but I was sort of dreading because it's one of those games that is infamously hard. And it is a fairly brutal game in the sense that you really do have to memorize the levels and you have to plan your approach and you have to be specific about your weapon choices so that you either change them situationally or you know what you're working with and plan your approach around whatever weapon you prefer and i feel like i feel like i did better at the game this month than i thought i was going to when i first bought uh, the reprint back in 2018 and got it in the mail, and I plugged it into my Super Nintendo very excitedly, and I played it, I realized, oh, this game is difficult. And of course, I knew that was coming because it's an R-Type game, and R-Type games are difficult, but what I wasn't expecting was to absolutely hit a wall in Stage 2 and have so much trouble dealing with the acid and, you know, getting up into that sort of chamber where that large enemy is at uh, approaching the wall and I quickly moved on and uh, you know went back to our, our shmup club game that month whatever that was uh, and I didn't really come back to it immediately because I thought well we're going to play this for the shmup club at some point so I'll definitely you know get my money's worth and and um, put some time into the game but I'm, I'm glad that I finally did. I was dreading Stage 4, and at first, Stage 4 was uh, a, big, a big wall. But after a little bit, it's a matter of you pay attention to where, to where the lava goes and where the safe spots are going to be for your ship. And then really, once you have that memorized, it's not that bad. Stage 4 is has that reputation of being really brutal and it still is difficult but it's a lot more doable and a lot more approachable than i thought it was going to be and i felt like maybe the the memorization was going to make it i don't know if the word is annoying or just cumbersome maybe but i really feel like even though i never perfectly made it through stage four without dying I feel like I could if I worked out a little bit more and I tightened up my approach a little bit. I feel like I could do stage four, at least up to the boss, without taking any deaths. And I could I could maybe do that whole level pretty successfully. And that's not something that I expected to hear myself say by the end of the month when I started playing the game early. But... I don't know if it's just that I acclimated reasonably well to the game or if I'm just feeling optimistic today, but uh, I had a, a, a good time with this game, maybe a little bit better than I was expecting. Even though I got frustrated with it here and there and, you know, stage four being that being a frustration point, but less so because of the level and more so because of the boss. Because the stage four boss is kind of ridiculous. But I think overall, other than how much the game then ramps up further for the final stage and just becomes, just kind of trolls you a little bit, I really feel like for the most part, I, I feel like I could... If not, if not one life, a good portion of the game, I feel like with a little bit more practice, I could probably no miss the first, I'll say two stages, maybe three, and I could probably do one credit up to stage five, if not stage six, with a little bit more practice. And for me saying that about an R-Type game, it's something I did not think I would ever say. 
So I feel pretty good about where I'm at with the game at this point, even though I didn't, even though I spent the month credit feeding and I didn't manage to even reach the final boss, I still feel like I made progress personally and got better and more insight into kind of the style of our type that I've always had difficulty wrapping my head around and coming to grips with in terms of of learning the stages and finding a route through the stages and then executing that route properly. I do feel like I finally maybe get the R-Type games a little bit better than I, than I have before. Uh, so whatever the next R-Type game is that we decide to cover, I feel like maybe I'll have a little bit more of a fighting chance at doing well with that game because I have have adapted to this one a lot faster and more um, more quickly than I thought I was going to. You know, if it's not our type Delta, I'm out of here. <laughs> so I guess uh, for you, I could say that you learned to stop worrying and embrace your masochistic sides. Well, I wouldn't go quite that far, but certainly I tried to approach it more casually and not worry about doing as much as I could on one credit. I was just credit feeding, trying to enjoy my time with it, and just trying to learn the levels. And I think by giving up on the idea of getting a 1cc in the game this month, I relaxed a little bit, I had more fun with it, and I ended up probably learning and adapting to the game better than I would have if I'd have just hammered hammered at it with one credit attempts and then always restarting. Yeah, I'm glad that you're saying this because I, I think that it, it sort of comes across this. And Mark MSX has talked about this where people will all of a sudden, like, why are you playing that way? Well, this is the way that it played for all my stuff. Well, yeah, but that way is played for people who know exactly how the game works. You, you just playing with a mindset of I'm going to get a 1cc or I'm going to be the best is not always the the correct solution there and it, it's nice to see that you've found something that that works for you and you're not immediately going you know at 100% just trying trying to get a, a one credit clear yeah and I think I may try and adopt a little bit more of a I don't want to say a let's just credit feed, but I may try and find a middle ground there where, you know, I start the month doing a little bit of credit feeding just so I can kind of see some of the game and get familiarized with the the mechanics and all of that stuff. And then as I begin to get further on in the month, then maybe start looking at, okay, how far can I get in one credit? So then I can start looking at putting up scores and things like that. But realistically, um, yeah, realistically, I think that that helped my approach this month. Yeah, I, I think there's no wrong way to shmup, and certainly for everything you said exemplifies that. I look, look forward to you hearing more, more about the different ways that you're approaching and testing this out for games like this. I, I almost think that... <laughs> oh, it, uh, Gradius 3, especially Gradius 3 Arcade, sort of defines this. No matter how much you, you, you play that game, that game will beat you back. But if you're not playing by the standard set of rules, then it certainly becomes a little bit more interesting. You're not, not always playing for all or nothing. Right. Well said. Well... Myself, I knew that this was going to be a hard game. It's an R-type game after all. I, my biggest problem with this game was setting aside my expectations versus what it, what it actually is. I have this problem where if I didn't grow up with it and I go back to a game, I, I'm much more critical of it than if I were to have grown up with it or played around this time. It's something that I've been struggling to learn to separate myself from. At first, when I played R-Type 3, I liked it, but it wasn't something that was... It's like, okay, this is pretty neat. I can see where they're going with this. 
but by playing it again and again throughout the month, I gained a lot more of appreciation for what it is versus what I thought it was. I, I, I definitely like the music in there. I like the one thing that definitely shocked me was how much they expect you to be a master of the force bit right out of the gate. I, I <laughs> took me a little bit used to that and. To get used to the claustrophobic feeling you had mentioned trying to deal with in stage two, that was a wall for me as well with the large enemy where you have to have it behind you and then you continuously have to fire it off to shoot off an arm to re remaneuver yourself. It's quite hard and you know, it, as we've spoken earlier, the people who are probably playing this or the people they had in mind who would play this were experts or people who had already cut their teeth on R-Type 1 and 2 and we're still playing shmups, so they got to be good at this type of games. Overall, I can see why it stands at the top of the Super Nintendo library, as well as why it, it sort of disappeared. I'm very thankful that the retro bit re-release happened so that more people can enjoy and play this game. I <laughs> do have to say I will not be buying the Game Boy Advance version anytime soon. Yeah. But I would highly recommend anybody who is interested in shmups to try this game out. It's certainly not going to be easy, but it's certainly going to be rewarding. Well said. And now that we've given our impressions here, why don't we start with some impressions from the Arv Generation community. Fomacho says, I got a late start, but I've been plugging through on it for the last week. On my first ever run, I cleared the first stage perfectly. Ever since then, it has given me trouble. It's too long, I think I just get bored and lazy. There's a few death spots in the first day, which is surprising, like the platform that speeds in for the right to destroy the third mech. Yeah, I don't think there's anyone who uh, wasn't caught by that first time. In general, this game is beating me up. I use save states to push my way through the whole game, so now I'll start doing some official runs. I got to stage 3 on a credit and 116,060 points. Not sure if we're interested in scores this month, since even an Infinity CC is an accomplishment. <laughs> Fair enough of that one. One nice thing about this game is the enemy variety. Even late game new enemy designs here. Shikondo was very light on that. Yeah, Shiki... Uh, followed what I like to refer to as the Dragon Quest method. Oh, this one's harder. What should we do? Well, let's make this enemy red. It used to be blue, and it was purple on stage two. Now it's red. And what force device is everyone selecting from the start? I like the Type 1 Round Force since I'm familiar with it. Type 2 Shadow Force doesn't seem to fit my style. And Type 3 Shadow Cyclone Force, sorry, Cyclone Force, with the blue power-up seems perfect for much of the game. Later on, absolutely, that stage 4 boss is rough. I've completed another run, and this time using just continues and not states. Dying is so punishing. Most checkpoints give you two, not the full three power-ups before bosses. I'm hoping this clear is a breakthrough and I can get through another run faster. Might take a tally of the number of continues I used since this run was easily 100 plus credit clear. I left the game on for days. Oh wow, okay, quick pro tip, if you haven't found it already. If you have the Type 3 Cyclone Force on the 4th stage boss, release the 4th, and it will sloppily target the boss and end the fight way quicker. Yeah, the the stage 4 boss was definitely my sticking point with the game. That's the part that I think is maybe strays a little bit too far from the R-Type mold and... Uh, there's a lot of RNG in that fight, it feels like. Uh, Easy Racer said, Even though I haven't made much progress, I'm having a lot of fun with this game. I pretty consistently make it to the midpoint of level 2. I credit spammed my way to the level 3 boss a few times, but there's a checkpoint in level 3 that was frustrating with a low-powered ship. That said, for all the deaths, for the most part, I feel like when I die, it's my fault usually knowing what I need to do, but failing to execute it. For me, that's much more fun than the games that feel almost like a puzzle in which I have to figure out the exact right placement through trial and error. 
playing this game has got me thinking about what the best shmups on the SNES are, because this definitely ranks among them. Great music, great controls, very difficult, but at least in the early stages seems fair. It's a tough call between this and Gradius 3, although it doesn't quite get into the level of enjoyment that UN Squadron and Space Megaforce bring. Uh, and then later in the thread, he said, Sat down and credit fed my way to some real progress tonight. Made it to stage 5. I know everyone has complained about the stage 4 boss, but I found it to be a lot of fun, reminding me a bit of bosses in action platformers where you're constantly moving and reacting. I hope that when R-Type 3 is covered on the podcast, plenty is said about the creative design to this game. It's really hard for me to think of games of the same era that use as much creativity in the use of elements and still pays close attention to detail. I mean, it's still a treat to me every time I see the red ro robot blow up in stage 1, partly because right before it explodes, it looks behind itself. These types of small details are littered throughout the game, but add a ton of character and make the game that much more distinct. Level 2's acid changing the stage, Level 4's routing of a maze both forward and reverse, backgrounds that continually affect the level design, and all kinds of others. Our next comment comes to us from Gollum. I credit fed this some 10 years ago and I remember getting a kick out of it, but the production values are high and the music is super awesome. So that would have been enough to get me through any shooter with infinite credits. Initial thoughts after scumming the stage four mid boss. Stage one is, well, a little long, I guess. Stage two is awesome. I love the acid melting the way the terrain. Stage two boss is a pain though. Well, I'm with you on that one, especially if you get those speed power-ups. It's hard not to compare Stage 4 from R-Type 3 and Stage 6 from R-Type. Stage 6 and R-Type is easier to follow, though, since the blocks move slower and the graphics are less busy. I'm wondering if the rope memorization will be the only feasible way to get through Stage 4 and R-Type 3. I'm eager to experiment with different ships. So far, I've only put an hour or so on the regular R-Type ship. I think you meant four spits on that one. I don't know how many speed ups I want. The extended charge shot is also very cool. In the original R type, I only used the charge shot for recovery on the stage 5 boss. And well, if you're recovering on the stage 5 boss, you're not getting it clear. But the big charge shot in R type 3 seems more useful, and the extended time commitment seems to make an interesting choice. I wonder how I'll feel about it as I keep playing. Regarding the third phase of the stage 4 boss, I think it takes 8 chirps or 4 direct hits with the second tier beam charge. I kept moving from one strategy to another and I settled on this. Open the fight with a hypercharge. Hypercharge clears first two phases. Hypercharge does about half the health of the third phase. Ride out the cooldown and make sure to stay in the horizontal middle of the screen and then finish it off with a second tier beam. I did a lot of grinding and muscle memory though. It really is a shame about the stage 4 boss. That stage is shallow memorization and the boss is a test of reflex that doesn't really fit the rest of the game. It's a shame because so much of the game stresses analysis in a way that fits the R-Type name. I like the st stage 6 beetles most of all. They have a lot of health so it takes a good deal to kill them whether that's charge time beforehand or time spent shooting directly. That's a big commitment, so you don't get many opportunities to kill them. So it's important to know and analyze exactly when the best is, uh, time is to take them out. However, they move slowly and predictably, so you don't pose any challenge to reflexes. This slow, unflinching threat characterizes R-Type, I think. Something unusual for R-Type is that the beetles track your position. You can kite them in the walls to kill them. This indirect layer of interplay is super cool. I also got a clear. Congratulations on the clear. Final thoughts. My best score to date is 605,130. After a clear with the Shadow Force, the Shadow Force does more damage than the Round Force. Seems like the Cyclone Force does damage comparable to the Shadow Force. I think... Game Boy Guru was right here. The second loop seems super cool. The second tier charges both hype beam and hyper and do a lot of help for recoveries. 
but because they are so useful, that they dilute the difference between the force pods. The charges are the kind of lowest denominator to get through anything, regardless of which force pod you picked. I'm going to go get a Cyclone Force Clear before moving on. And Blur STG says, Well, I definitely came in super late to the party this month. I fell into a deep hole of playing Cave and Bullet Hells and had to pull myself out before November was over. I've spent three days with R-Type 3 so far, getting better each day. Today I made it to stage 5 on one credit, so hoping to at least grab the 1cc before the month ends. Hope everyone else is enjoying this game. And then final thoughts. I love this game so much. I love the look, the feel, the music, everything. But this game pisses me off to no end. <laughs> I find hitboxes and damage inconsistent in multiple areas. Two good examples are the Stage 2 Eyeball boss and the spiders on the final stage. There are times in Stage 2 boss that I kill him in like 6 hits, and you know it's a hit because it makes an audible sound and flashes. Other times, it takes me 9 hits. And those spiders on the final stage, man. Sometimes a charge shot wipes them out. Sometimes it kills none, or one, or two of them. It's infuriating. Still, a great game all around. Just very frustrating at times. I'm glad to be done. I truly think I am capable of a no-miss of this, given a bit more time. I should have started at the beginning of November. I may come back to it at some point and go for the two-all and a no-miss. Yeah, the the bit about the, about the uh, inconsistencies with the hitbox and stuff, I, I didn't quite have that but i think i know what you're talking about blur on the the stage two eyeball boss and i think that's what um uh what Gollum may have alluded to early on where uh or um or faux macho where it takes uh a certain amount of damage to take out that boss and i think if you're not if you don't have direct hits to the eye, but you're only hitting it kind of with the periphery of the double-charged beam, that maybe it doesn't do as much damage. And so I think that might be uh, why it's inconsistent. Our next comment comes to us from Corkman. I didn't get a chance to play much the second half of the month, but I was able to get to stage three on a single credit and able to credit feed up to stage five. I was able to appreciate our type games more this month after playing this one. I didn't really care for the series no what I had played before, however I think I adjusted my expectations going in, knowing the series is not a fast paced or a Don Maku type of game. I found some fun in treating this game as almost a side scrolling puzzle game where the objective was to make it from one checkpoint to another. I'll definitely come back to the series at some point, I've been meaning to try out our type final, well the first one, since I hear good things. Well, thank you for try trying it out and trying something new. I know that uh, much even my expectations were a little bit different here, but I was pleasantly surprised in the end, and I'm glad that you were able to find something you like about it. That's what the Shmup Club is all about, trying new things, and if you like it, great. You found something new, and if you haven't, well, just wait it out till next month, and we'll have something new. Yeah, so I guess now's a good time to sort of finalize our thoughts on the game and I guess I'll just quickly summarize what I said before in that I ended up enjoying this game more than I thought I would I'm glad we played it and I'm happy to say that despite my frustrations some of which were fairly visible on stream I really did have a good experience with this and I certainly think that my time with R-Type 3 was way more productive than I expected it to be. I thought maybe I was going to get stuck in Stage 2 for half of the month. Uh, but honestly, yeah, I was credit feeding through the game. But uh, like I said, I feel like I, could, like I could make significant progress in this game if I put a little bit more time into it. So I feel pretty good about, about where I ended up. And... Uh, I'm glad that, that we tackled this game. Yeah, I'm going to throw this in here. I know it's cliche, I know it's, yeah, but I'm going to call all this. I'm glad we did this because this game is Dark Souls hard, where it, it's not unbeatable, but, but it certainly is a challenge. 
this this game will not uh, if you make a mistake the game will call you out on it and yeah. it will punish you but it's not going to be hard enough where you're, you're just going to get close to rage quitting like you might <laughs> with gratis through arcade it doesn't do any hand holding it doesn't expect to give you anything that's going to well for the most part break the game but it, it's it expects you to perform at a certain level and it's going to beat you up until you do and, and make you get, for lack of better words here, phrasing, get good. And I, I think that these type of challenges in games are necessity in surprising way of finding out things or, or measuring your own skill or, or managing your own expectations in different ways and i'm definitely glad we had a chance to play this game be one that i find myself coming back to yeah it's a good summary so let's talk about what we've got coming up next well what we got coming up next we have christmas and new year's right so (laughs) (laughs) so all right now what we have coming up next is We have a shorter game, but one that so many people have played and loved is Jackal, also known as Top Gunner. So that's out on the Mister, and it's out on, of course, the Nintendo. It is a game that can be a little difficult, but is certainly a lot of fun. So we're looking forward to a lot of responses for this one. And then get ready to rockabilly in the new year with Airsonk. Yeah. We'll probably see the return of Studio Mudprints. We just might. And we're also going to be doing some changes for this next year. Uh, One of the things that we tried to do here the last couple of years was to pick a very high-profile game for January and then sort of make that a score game for the year so that people could play the game throughout the year and, uh, you know, submit scores and we could have a sort of a leaderboard for that. I think the idea was good, but the execution I'm gonna, I'm was gonna, lacking. Yeah, and I'm going to take responsibility for that because I was trying to do the the leaderboard and was trying to do that, and I just didn't promote it very well, and we didn't end up talking about the game throughout the year like I was hoping we would, and I know I fell off of playing the game throughout the year. So what what I thought we could do going forward is a couple of things. Number one, I think we might add just a little bit of of shmup news to the podcast early in the episode. That's one of the suggestions that we've had from kind of the listeners and and, uh, some of the feedback that we've got. So we might start doing that. And it, it won't be very long, probably, but it would be nice to for listeners, particularly those who are listening in a fairly timely manner when the episodes get released, to sort of know what's coming up, what games are are being announced, what stuff has has been announced as oh this is going to be up for pre order at this point. Uh, you know, it'd be nice to be able to kind of put that stuff out there so that for those who maybe aren't as who maybe aren't as embedded in the scene as we are just may not know certain things that are coming out uh whether it's big releases that are coming that you know well there's a digital release out but there's then the physical that's going to be a pre-order or when there's a new indie game that's come out you know it'd be nice to be able to throw these things out there so the people are at least aware of them yeah we're going to call it shut up and shmup it (laughs) right uh but then instead of doing uh picking a high profile game for January and then sort of making that a score game throughout the year. Instead, what I thought we could do is pick a game that would sort of be like our all year game that we kind of talk about throughout the year. And so for every episode, while we'll have a main game that we'll talk about, we'll also get a little bit of discussion as we play the game throughout the year that what will be what we will call Uh, focus shot and so the way that we're going to open this up is since it's been out digitally now on the switch it's out on it's been out on steam for a while and of course the physical's coming out uh soonish from limited run uh 
our focus shot game for 2022 is going to be Deep Mushi Space Hime Sama. <laughs> no, <laughs> not Deep Space Waifus. It's going to be Mushi Hime Sama. And the hope is that for those who want something that they can sink their teeth into and sort of dig into a little bit more specifically, that maybe we can get some folks playing that alongside whatever we're doing each month, but then also digging into this game that has a lot going on and a lot of, of mechanics and a lot of modes so that maybe then people can play that alongside us. We can have lengthier discussions on the forum or in the discord and, uh, you know, have a more broad discussion on those things. And then we would wrap at the end of the year with a more of a long form, uh, I guess you would say a bonus episode, you know, instead of just getting one episode every month and then occasionally a guide in, we would have a, a full episode at the end of the year that would be fully dedicated to our focus shot game. We could sort of compile all of our thoughts going back through the whole year on this much more, long form experience and then hopefully be able to really do an even greater deep dive into that game than we have with what we've done so far. So I think that will maybe give us the ability to a better cover some of these games like Mushihime Sama that are, I would say more deserving of a deeper dive, but then B better encourage us to play the games consistently throughout the year so that by the time we get to that point it's more than just us talking about our experience for the month and then bringing on a Mark MSX or someone who would talk about the game alongside us. We may still do that but this way we are it's also pulling from several months of us experiencing this title and getting to know it and you know, building our skills with the games and then being able to speak about that a lot more uh, authoritatively, I guess I would say. So I think that'll be a, a really good deal. Yeah, we don't want it to end up like a New Year's resolution where it starts out strong, but by July it's completely gone. Yeah, and I mean, that's kind of what happened with with uh, Battle Garega this year. And again, that's that's on me. You Wait, know, Battle Garega was this year? Uh, that was... Uh, wasn't that January? Was <laughs> shoot. <laughs> <laughs> but see, that's what I'm saying. Oh you know, no! I, it I mean, feels we, like yeah. you know this. This Battle Greg, I felt like it was two years ago. I swear that this uh, COVID time is uh, doing funny things. Yeah, 2021 has been a very. It's felt like a very long year, and yeah, Battle Greg was our January game, and so yeah, that that's why I'm hoping that this will help us to take the deeper dive into these games, but stay with them and really help to kind of flesh out that discussion and make those discussions that much more uh, meaningful and impactful. I'm also hoping that by doing so, number one, I can, I can change up my streams a little bit because then I can switch back and forth between streaming the shmup of the month and then streaming Mushi. And then also, I'm hoping that this will help push me into the next level as a player and maybe help encourage some of the other folks who play alongside us to kind of take the same approach. And, you know, here's a game you can focus on, not just one for one month like we do with most of our stuff, but here's something that you can do on a more long-form basis to sort of really dig into a game and just just dedicate time and effort to, to to clearing it. And particularly for a game like Mushi that has multiple modes and ways to play it, you know, for, for a, a seasoned player, they could come into something like this and say, okay, I'm going to learn to clear, uh, you know, Mushi Ultra. Whereas myself, you know, I, I cleared Novice already. Maybe... You know, I want to try and clear 1.0 and then go back and do 1.5 or a range. These are the kinds of things that I want to try to get to, to where I can start to hone my skills a little bit more and 
develop my own ability to sort of practice, learn, and play these games. Yeah, this is so much better than the idea I had. I was going to suggest opening up a GoFundMe to get you a Fatari PCB. <laughs> oh, jeez. Uh, well, I don't know how useful that would have been, since I don't have a super gun or anything like that, but uh, I, I still wouldn't say no to that. The other thing that we're going to be doing, and I'm not going to spoil it yet, because I think we'll wait just a little bit to reveal it, but we are planning on a summer event uh, for 2022 where we're going to take the summer and then use that time to focus on a specific series of games. So we're going to be taking one game each for June, July, and August, and that's going to be sort of the focus over the summer of that series of games. And so I think it's going to be a lot of fun, and it's definitely going to scratch uh, some important games off the list and give us a chance to sort of give a certain game series its due in terms of uh, one that has been very influential. And just to clarify here, there is no relation to uh, Shmup, Slam, Shlam, uh, Shmup Slam with this. Right. Yeah, this is just us, uh, you know, basically picking three games from the same series to kind of do in succession that is different than what we usually do, because we usually try and vary it up quite a bit. But this is something we thought would be, kind of be a fun way of of changing it up a little bit. Yep, we've got some jets, some coffee, and all sorts of stuff ready for this summer. <laughs> Yep. Uh, and I also like to thank everyone who stuck around and helped us grow and has, has uh, listened to our ramblings. And th thank you all for that. Uh, that. That has been the greatest gift of all this year. Merry Christmas to you and yours, and thank you all for the support that you have given us and listening to us and playing games with us. We certainly enjoy it and. Uh, I hope that people discover new games that they would like to try or new or for new, some people even new genres it's always something fun to do and um, it, it, exciting because you never know what's going to come around the corner next absolutely um, aside from everyone who has helped us grow and helped us into us i'd also like to thank Ed of Studio Ma Prince and, or Bullet Heaven for the logo. I'd like to mention Kogasu for the intro and outro music. I'd like to thank everyone from the RF Generation Playcast and Collector Cast. And I'd like to thank Metalfro for providing an endless stream of entertainment and uh, dogs that will try almost any position to get your attention. Yeah, well, the last couple of streams I've done, they were very persistent so <laughs> i thought you had a parrot for a second but no it was your dog uh, yeah well someone was asking me they they said how do you how do you shmup with uh with the dogs uh constantly trying to get your attention like that and i i kind of said well after a while you just sort of get used to it <laughs> yeah i mean you would have to this. yeah you don't really have any other choice all right. Anything else that we need to mention before we wrap up? No, I just wish everyone to stay, stay safe and uh, have a great Christmas and New Year. Absolutely. Well, thank you all f so much for listening, and we will catch you in 2022.